Let's go quickly through abolitionism in Washington County, what it might look like. White abolitionists were a small, often despised minority. I think this is really important to, to emphasize. If you were a white abolitionist in the 1840s and 1850s, what you advocated was the people with the most wealth and power in this society being stripped of their wealth and power and that wealth and power given to the poorest people in this society. It did not get you invited to a lot of dinner parties. You had, you had If you were a real abolitionist for immediate abolition, it meant you were against the US government. You The US government was your enemy because it was the bulwark of defense of slavery. So to be an abolitionist also meant that you, you know, it was considered something like being a communist in the 1950s or, you know, something like that. You were, you were totally against what America was about and you were trying to bring relationships that were alien to the United States here with your abolitionism. So in Ypsilanti, the Liberty Party is the anti-slavery party in 1844, there's only 23 votes for the Liberty Party here in Ypsilanti, right? Ypsilanti is a democratic uh, um, uh, uh, party uh, uh, city, even during the Civil War, it will not become overwhelmingly Republican or anti-slavery. It will not even vote for Lincoln in 1864, unlike the rest of Washtenaw County. So uh, Ypsilanti is actually has a, a somewhat pro-slavery even reputation in this period, unlike the, the reputation it has today, which has been an anti-slavery reputation. There were absolutely whites local in Washington County who were intimately involved in this movement. The Beckley, Chase, Glazer, DeGarmo, Moore, and McAndrews families were all involved. The Signal of Liberty was a very important abolitionist newspaper that was produced in Ann Arbor in Lower Town, and it was connected to the Liberty Party. Um, uh, but you know, you could, if you were black, could you join the Liberty Party? Well, I suppose you could, but you can't vote and you can't get elected. So what's the use, right? So the Liberty Party is an overwhelmingly white party. It's almost exclusively white because it's about voting in elections, which black people are not allowed to do. Black families like the Arrays, Days, Stewarts, and Ocros are involved. And we see uh, black Washtenaw County involved in civil rights movements and movements for black rights all the way, the earliest reference I have is in 1843, where black families from Ypsilanti go to the Michigan Colored Men's Convention to demand equal rights and the removal of the word white from the Michigan Constitution. So there's never not been a civil rights movement in Ypsilanti, even when there was, was slavery, people are demanding political rights. Salem Township here in Washington County is a rural center of abolitionism. And uh, if you wanna know more about that, Carol Moll's book um, is, is where you go for that. African Americans become increasingly prominent in the abolitionist movement here as their population grows. Nearby Detroit, because of, of its geographic location, becomes a center of black abolitionist activity. And because of that, it also becomes a center of slave hunting. So Detroit will be one of the few northern cities that actually has a slave pen in it to, for people to be returned back to slavery because so many people are trying to go through Detroit to Canada. Again, black people could not vote or participate in politics as white men could. So the kind of politics you are gonna engage in as a black man or woman are going to be different than the kind of politics you are gonna engage in as a white man or woman. I don't have time to go into some of these articles here, but there are articles about local activities of white abolitionists on the Underground Railroad. One I do wanna point out is Samuel D. Moore, who is a remarkable man. He was a radical Quaker from um, near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And if people have ever heard of the Christiana defense or the Christiana riot by where um, uh, a black man named William Parker and his family defended themselves against slave hunters. A, um, the slave hunter was actually the, the so-called owner was killed in that confrontation. And Samuel Moore and other Quakers, radical Quakers hid the Parker family until they could get to the Buxton settlement in Elgin in Canada. Samuel Moore and his brothers were then targeted uh, by uh, uh, white supremacists, pro-slavery people, and had to leave um, had to leave Pennsylvania, and they would settle right at Bemis and Tuttle Hill, where uh, Alban Cemetery is on the south side of Ypsilanti, and there grew around the Alban Cemetery, that there's a little Quaker church down there, a, a radical Quaker abolitionist community. 
And the Alban Cemetery to this day is a integrated cemetery. It was one of the first integrated cemeteries in this area. So one of the, I, I think that many black families get buried down there and don't know that the reason why Alban Cemetery is a place where black people get buried goes all the way back to the Quaker tradition. My friend who just passed away, Nelson Freeman, who comes from an Ypsilanti family going all, black family going all the way back to the 1870s and before that into Canada was just recently buried at Alban Cemetery. Um, and uh, uh, Samuel Moore was very active here. He's actually expelled from the Quakers here uh, for being too radical and saying that the Quakers need to not just speak against slavery, but act against slavery. And he actually threw cow's blood onto the door of the Quaker meeting hall on Bemis and, and Tuttle Hill as a protest against their hands being dirty with the blood of slavery. And here he writes in 1856, to, uh, the anti, uh, to an anti-slavery newspaper. In view of the direct relation that the state of Michigan through the central government sustains the unrighteous and God-defined system of chattel slavery, and in view of the utter recklessness of citizens of the state in regard to their position in this morally corrupting and God-forsaken government, I have been renownedly convinced in my own mind that it is morally wrong for me to voluntarily sustain it by paying taxes. I therefore, in accordance with my honest conviction of right, enter my solemn protest against sustaining said state and national governments by voluntarily paying its assessed taxes. My protest accepted by the agent of government is as follow. And because he's an abolitionist, he says, know all men and women. He makes sure that he's addressing women too, because he's a good radical abolitionist. Know all men and women by this, that as the state of Michigan through the central government is pledged to sustain and protect the unrighteous system of chattel slavery, that I hereby refuse my own free and will and consent to pay all taxes and sustain said state and national government. Samuel Moore was uh, one of these stalwarts of the anti-slavery movement in this area and his farm and the farm of his brother definitely would have been places uh, that were active on the Underground Railroad. He would end up moving down to Raisin Center and live right next to uh, Laura Haviland, the great abolitionist leader there in a radical Quaker community in Raisin Center. And he's buried down uh, right in Adrian, Michigan, right by Laura Haviland. Okay, let's continue. Here's the McAndrew family. Um, the McAndrew families are a remarkable family. They're from Scotland. They come from a, a dissenting uh, religious position in Scotland. Uh, and the dissenting religious position in Scotland, meaning not the Church of England, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, uh, Calvinists, those kinds of people. Um, that was a, a real bedrock of anti-slavery activity in Britain. And the McAndrew family had their anti-slavery position already in Scotland. And they came here uh, to Baltimore. Um, and in Baltimore, which is a slave city and a slave state, they opened a school for African-Americans, which was illegal in their home. And they had to leave Baltimore after threats from white mobs. They eventually settled here in Ypsilanti. Uh, and um, uh, uh, William McAndrew, you can see he's a cabinet maker. And it says, friend McAndrews is one of your genial men that everybody loves to patronize. Some years ago, he came over from Bonnie, England. And unlike some other Englishmen, he has brought a true spirit to this country of patriot in every sense of the term, a true Democrat scorning oppression and loving freedom for all men. But he is good enterprising workman. He keeps a number of hands employed, not only manufacture the best kinds of work, but also imports from abroad. So he's this is his advertisement in the Ypsilanti paper. And he's advertising in some his anti-slavery position right in the Ypsilanti paper. Now, Helen McAndrew is a really interesting woman. She is educated, she's committed, she's politically engaged, she's religiously engaged, but she's also a woman where women don't have rights. She also sees that one of the issues in Ypsilanti is not just slavery, it's lack of medical care, right? It's, it's what once black people are freed from slavery, it's lack of access to all kinds of services and needs. And so uh, Helen McAndrew was determined that poor people, black people and women could get medical services here in Ypsilanti. So she went to Rhode Island on her own, had William take care of the kids and she uh, um, uh, got her medical degree as a, a, you know, as a woman on her own, leaving her family behind. And she came back and opened a 
a, um, a, a hospital, a salon, you know, a spa, and it, it's this uh, octagon house. Back in the 1850s, if you were a progressive person politically, you had to build an octagon house. It was like having a Prius or something. You just had to do it. And uh, that octagon house was called The Rest for the Weary, and it was right there on South Huron Street um, near where our bed and breakfast is today. And that also would have seen activity on the Underground Railroad. I do want to say a little something about Ypsilanti on the Underground Rail, because I think there's a lot of myths about it. Um, there's a lot of talk in Ypsilanti about um, um, uh, um, tunnels underneath the city that go to the Huron River. The Huron River was absolutely not a navigable river. Nobody would have tried to escape through the Huron River. There would have been maybe three dozen dams between here and uh, Lake Erie. So you would not have been able to travel the Huron River on a boat down to Lake Erie. So people were not escaping by the Huron River. They were not getting into tunnels and going into the Huron River. That's not what was happening. Those tunnels are all built for water, for water management. That's exactly what they're built for. So if you have a tunnel under your house and you think it was the Underground Railroad, it was not. I'm sorry, it was, it was for the uh, water uh, 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 management in the city. That said, there are a couple of places where we know the Underground Railroad was active in the city. Um, the, the home of the McCoy family on the Starkweather farm, not the Starkweather farm itself, but the home of the McCoy family. Uh, we know that that would have been active on the Underground Railroad. And we know that the Array family uh, southwest of, of Ypsilanti would have been active on the Underground Railroad. But by and large, all of the, you know, the, the people who say that my home was active on the under we have zero, zero, zero proof of that, right? And there is only proof of a couple of, um, of, of places in Ypsilanti where we can say definitively people stayed on the Underground Railroad. Well, why is that? Because most of people who were coming through Ypsilanti on the Underground Railroad were staying in the Black community secretly, right? And, and you did not write about these things. You did not advertise about these things. So we're not going to know about the vast majority of people who came through here. And most, you know, if you weren't being followed and if there wasn't a threat, you came quite openly. You know, sometimes the Underground Railroad was buying a train ticket and just getting on the train and going to Canada, right? It wasn't necessarily hiding all the time. I think that's, you know, like... It, it makes people be so passive and it makes, you know, that's not the way people were. And because it's the Underground Railroad, nobody hides in an attic. It's always in the basement, I have found, right? Uh, but generally people were living openly here. And if you knew that there was a slave hunter around because you had a vigilant society and people had their eyes around, then you would go to ground and kind of hide and all of that kind of stuff. But mostly you lived openly, even if you were a person who had escaped from slavery, you would change your name or something like that. But people weren't hiding out in attics all the time. Please, that is not what Black people were doing here in Ypsilanti. Uh, 